Exodus chapter 7. Then turn over to Matthew 16. I have decided that we're going, what I thought was going to be just one sermon, there was so much. Um, I've decided to break it up into two smaller messages. And uh, sometimes I think, why do you apologize for this? Aren't you paying me to study God's word? That's my job. And it's not, that's not really the right word to say. It's my calling. I'm supposed to study it. And so I hope you're not offended that we take our time and we dig as deep as I can go. And I'm not offended if you go further. All right. All right. Matthew 16. Verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He being Jesus answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red in the houring. O ye hypocr hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? When, when, which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye yet not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And next week, Lord willing, we'll get to that. Now I'll turn over to Exodus chapter 7 and verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sor sorcerers and the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man's rod, his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. It's, uh, verse 19, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let my people go. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we come to you, and we ask that you would show us the proper way in which we should respond to the events that are going on in our lives. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would guide and direct this morning, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen, and you may be seated. Isn't it amazing how many different interpretations there can be to an event that goes on in this world? It seems like there's a zillion different explanations as to why something may be happening. Just think of your own self. Something happens in your life and you tell 10 people the event that has happened during your life and you're going to get 10 different explanations as to why that event happened in your life. All right. But we, we need to be aware of what's going on and we need to have a reasonable explanation for it because God speaks to us and we need to know what God is telling us. And what I'm specifically talking about or specifically talking about is when God speaks to us through his word. All right. But not only when he speaks to us through his word, but when life events happen, do we understand what is going on now to 
for the Christian, our hearts always need to be opened and they need to be guarded. They need to be open to hear what God says, but we need to be guarded in the sense that sometimes people tell us things that are not truthful nor godly, though they may come across as trying to be so. That's what I mean by being open and guarded. Well, I was reading the other day out of the uh, Gospel of Matthew, the verses we just read, and I'm, while simultaneously I was reading through the book of Exodus. And something occurred to me that had never occurred to me before, that the Pharisees and Pharaoh of Egypt during this time were very similar. All right? And what drew my attention was the word signs. All right? One of those two groups, one individual, Pharaoh, he got 10 signs in a row. We don't call them signs. We call them plagues. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus said, you get none. But what struck me is both of them ended up with the same kind of heart. The one who got 10 and the ones who got none both ended up in the same place. They both ended up in a state of unbelief. And so that I found that curious because what if God is speaking to me? Now, I don't know if you're going to have a burning bush moment. I don't know if it's going to be that blatant and obvious, though it, it possibly could be. But here's the point. If God is speaking to me, am I missing it? Is it possible for me, just like a Pharisee or a Pharaoh, to harden my heart? And it won't necessarily be in a broad area. It's usually in a more specific area that a Christian is apt to do. But my question is the same. Could I do that to God? When he is speaking to me, could I harden my heart and not be receptive to the information that he is giving to me? All right? So I want to be prepared when God speaks to me, and I want to understand, I want to have the appropriate understanding, and I do not want to be doubting, I want to be believing. And so I need to understand some of these principles we're going to go through, not only for myself, but so that I can understand people around me who may not know Jesus Christ as Savior as well. They may misunderstand the events going on in their life as well. Here's the classic example. Somebody has a devastating health problem, cancer, uh, some other debilitating disease. And God, but they don't know Jesus Christ. And God heals them. Many people, and when that happens, who do not know Jesus Christ are going to interpret their healing this way. I must be okay with God because I'm what? I'm healed. But that's not God's interpretation. God's interpretation is my kindness was to lead you to repentance. So we have two events going. We have the same event interpreted two totally and drastically different ways. All right. And so when God does speak to us, we don't want to have our hearts hardened, but we also want to be able to interpret it the way that God has meant for that event to be interpreted in our lives. So, normally I have all kinds of points, normally three, but you're going to be glad to hear we've got one. And it's going to take all morning, yeah, all morning to do this one point. God, for God, notice the, the spelling of both. God, big G, for God, little g. All right? As we work our way through this passage, these passages this morning, all right? Having to do with people not seeing what's going on in their lives or not seeing what God or not understanding what God has said to them. Many of us, and I'm not slamming anybody, 
many of us have a very difficult time of getting alone with God on a regular basis, day in and day out, and having it be meaningful, okay? Many American Christians struggle with that due to the time schedules we keep. I'm not justifying anything. I'm just telling you what's reality. So when I do spend my time with God, it is absolutely essential that nothing go over my head. It's absolutely essential that my heart be not hardened so that I don't receive anything. It's essential that when God speaks to me, that I understand exactly what he is saying, or I spend a little time trying to figure it out because I can't afford to let things go over my head. So we're going to look at a couple of examples this morning. And it really has to focus around this phrase that is found in your Old Testament, specifically with Pharaoh, when Pharaoh hardened his heart. Okay? My question to me is, to myself is, is it possible, am I capable as a follower of Jesus Christ to harden my heart? And the answer is, absolutely I can. And as I mentioned before, it is not usually in a broad scope of truth. It's usually in a specific area God has really put his finger on in your life that you are just struggling with. And he starts speaking to you and you start hardening your heart. All right. So in either case, whether I get responses from God or not, as the Pharisees and the Pharaoh, what I don't want to happen is to have a heart of unbelief in one particular area or a couple of areas as a Christian, all right? So we're going to take a look at hardening our hearts. And you don't need to write all these down. I'll be glad to Xerox them off and show you to you. When the Bible speaks of your heart, now if you're in ninth grade, 10th grade biology, you know what we're talking about when we talk about hearts. We're talking about the four chambers, the valves, blah, 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 blah. But that's not what the Bible's talking about. When the Bible starts talking about your heart, it's talking about the seat of your emotion. There's the verses to back that up. It's talking about your intelligence. There's the verses to back it up. It's talking about morality. There are the verses. It's talking about human choice. It's talking about religious life. Okay? In summary, the heart, in effect, is the whole person in all of his or her distinctive humanity. This is what distinguishes you from your dog, among other things. This is the image you bear from God. His planning, his willing, his feeling, his worshiping, his social interacting being. So you can see what the Bible means by heart, how detrimental it would be if something happened to it. In a couple of weeks or months, we're going to go review uh, Quieting a Noisy Soul by Jim Berg, and he's going to show the detrimental effects when these things happen in your heart, in your mind, the problems that the, you can incur. So, and of course, when the person is not living according to God's will, it is the heart that is described as darkened. It is the heart described as darkened, callous, rebellion, unfeeling, and idolatrous. It is within the heart that God works. Oh, I should put that back up. I love this. Ezekiel 11, 9. And I will give them one heart and will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. That's what God's talking about when he saves you. He makes and gives you a fleshly heart. And that fleshly heart, you don't want to turn it back and make it a stone heart. That's what he's saying there. So the heart represents the total response of a person to life around him or her and to the religious and moral demands of God. Hardness of heart thus describes a negative condition in which the person ignores, spurns, or reject, rejects the gracious offer of God. All right? A hardened heart is what we do not want. So do we have some scenarios of this? 
in Exodus 7, 10 through 13. Here's what happens. <clears throat> First example of when Pharaoh hardened his heart. Moses is told by God to deliver the people. Okay? And Moses is told by God, here are signs to show to Pharaoh so that I can take my children out with a strong arm. The first thing I want you to do is, I want you to walk into Pharaoh, that rod in your hand, I want you to cast it down. He'd already done this, right? When he spoke to him at the burning bush. I want you to cast that rod down and it is going to become a serpent. And then pick it back up again. So Moses goes in, I don't know if he knocked or whatever he did to see Pharaoh, and he walked into Pharaoh's presence and he said, let my people go. Now that's pretty direct command, pretty clear command, correct? Not too much ambiguity there. And for the sign, Moses took his rod and he did what? Threw it down. But then what happened after that? Pharaoh said, I can match that. I can accomplish the same results doing it my way. So he brought in his magicians, his agents of evil, and they threw the rod down and it became what? It became a serpent. And the Bible says, as a result of that, Pharaoh hardened his what? Harden his heart. When the internal conversation goes something like this, God has his rod, but so do I. When God says, this is how I want this to be achieved, and you say in your heart, but I also know how to achieve it. And I determine I'm not going to let God throw down his rod, but I'm going to throw down my rod. Meaning some other, uh, other ungodly way. And when I say ungodly, I'm not meaning illegal. All right? I'm talking about something that may be totally legal in America, but it is not God's way for you to accomplish it. You may desire a certain monetary outcome in your life. You may desire a certain emotional experience. You may desire a certain experience in the workplace or the corporation, a certain identification among your peers, a certain response from your spouse. And God says, you want that? This is how you're going to do it. And you think to yourself in that particular area, no, I think I'll pick up my rod and throw it down. And when Pharaoh saw that he could duplicate the outcome that God gave, the Bible said Pharaoh did what to his heart? Hardened it. When he figured out, I can get the same results doing it my way, with my means, and with my people, and with my abilities, and with my, 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 whatever else you want to throw in there, when he figured it out, he could get the same, not different results, the exact same results, doing it his way, the Bible says Pharaoh did what? He hardened his heart. Now, do you have particular outcomes in your life? Young people, do you have particular outcomes you want out of your life? You have this ability to see your life down the road. Do you have certain desires, certain things you hope to achieve? Older people, do you have certain things you still desire to achieve? Are we going to do it God's way, or are we going to pick up our rod and throw our rod down? I guarantee you, you're going to read a verse in your Bible that's going to contradict the way in which you think you may want to achieve it, and you're going to be left with a difficult decision to make. Am I going to do it God's way, or am I going to throw my rod down? <clears throat> a lot of people are. 
And now in America, we're throwing our rods down and we're daring God. And we'll get to that in a moment. So how can I harden my heart when I go God for God? When I try to match God with my God and I try to go toe to toe with him because I know in my heart I can achieve the same outcomes as God is saying I will achieve by doing it his way, except I don't want to do it his way. I want to do it my way. And if the outcome's the same, what difference does it make? And the difference it makes is everything. Next one. Exodus 8, 6 through 15. Let's turn over there. At least no one's afraid of frogs or no one went, uh, or uck. Chapter 8, verse 6, And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs up upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and of thy people to destroy the frogs from <clears throat> thee and thy house that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow... And he said, tomorrow, and he said, be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy house and from thy servants and from thy people, and they shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields, and they were gathered together upon heaps in the land and stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his what? He hardened his heart. This is a great plague. I've got up there, the frogs were not for an all-you-could-eat frog leg fry to raise funds for a local convention, okay? I want you to understand that because of what Pharaoh did. All right? So Pharaoh, so there's these frogs. It is called a plague. So Pharaoh brings in his guys and does what? Makes more disaster. He creates more problems for the people that he's supposed to be protecting and ruling over. That's what I'm saying. And what, don't think that there was, he is causing more problems. Why? Because he can what? Because he can. Because he can do this. He's not using that for good. He's just doing it because he what? Because he can not realizing that what he's doing is destroying the people he's supposed to be protecting. Has that ever happened? Have you ever known of anybody to harden their heart against God just because they can and do something just to show God what for, and, but in the process, destroying the people around them. Ever seen that? What's going on with this drug addiction stuff? People are bringing the ones they love down with them. Can somebody, women don't answer this question, can somebody be so stubborn to do something their 
way and they're going to do it just to prove a point but in the process destroy their family destroy their community destroy their church here comes Pharaoh <laughs> all these frogs causing all kinds of problems they're everywhere can you imagine that ladies there are everywhere and here comes Pharaoh. Oh, I can do that. If there's not enough already in your home, I'm going to make what? I'm going to make more and make your trouble what? Worse. Just because I... Young people, the minute, the minute you realize you're screwing up, turn. Turn. turn don't call down more frogs just because you can turn get out of there get get help at, go to God Remember, we sing the song and we're glad there's room at the cross for everyone and there's room at the cross for everyone's sins So when does Pharaoh change his mind? Well, not when he does it, but when he realizes he can't fix it. He brought it on, but then he realizes he has no power to make it go away. Now I'm ready to listen to God. You know, pain is an interesting thing. Suffering is an interesting phenomenon. In this way, and we'll, I'll build on this next Sunday when we go to comfort and, and that in 2 Corinthians. We as believers seem to be a whole lot more obedient in that condition. We seem to be a whole lot more attentive to what God has to say when we're not well, our problem seems not, I know that's a generalization. Our problem seems to be when things go right. So Pharaoh realizes he can't fix this. So let's fill in the gaps because this, this is almost hilarious. And it, it will just show you how blind and stubborn you can be. All right? If it, it weren't so funny, if it weren't real, and we all could see ourselves in it or someone else in it. Chapter 8, verse number 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice unto the Lord. That's reasonable. Hey, he realized, I can't, yeah, I caused a whole lot of problems, but I can't resolve them. Isn't that where God finds most of us? And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. That is a term of respect. It'd be... Like, going up to the king, going up to the president, hey, you tell me, all right? He's, it's a sign of respect. Only time that phrase is used, so it's difficult to truly understand the meaning, but it is most likely a term of respect. It's Moses talking to the king, talking to Pharaoh. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servant and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the rivers only? Now, when would you say... Right now. So it's hilarious when you look at verse 10 and Pharaoh says what? How about tomorrow? He still doesn't believe. Could be chance that they went away right now. Listen, I'm going to tell you tomorrow at 10, I want them gone. I'll let my people suffer 12, 24 more hours because of my stubbornness. 
Because the normal person would have said, no. I'll get saved when I'm good and ready. You're not ready. Because if you were, you would say when? Now. Their heart is hardened. So, what happens? God releases them. God takes them away. And Pharaoh does what? Hardens his heart. Isn't that what we do? God, if you will, we're in a time of distress. We're in a time of strain. We're in a time of tribulation. God, if you will do this, I'll do that. God takes it away and we are just like the Israelites. Eh, change my mind. That's what I mean. Suffering is a peculiar topic, and I really mean that. That would be a great in-depth study. Why does God use it? Well, I can tell you just a superficial observation. We tend to pay more attention, but we also tend to pay less attention once it's gone. Exodus 8, 18, up until this point, Pharaoh's match God for God. And so it comes to this next one, verse 18, and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not do it. So they go to Pharaoh and say, hey, boss, we can't do this one. We can't match this one. This one has to be from who? Like, the, where were the other ones from? Just because you matched them doesn't mean that was from God. But apparently when something happens in my life where I can't throw down my rod, I apparently realize something's going on here. In other words, God had to bring Pharaoh and the magicians and the sorcerers to a position where they understood the only explanation for this is not us. It has to be, it has to be God. And sometimes that's exactly how God gets our attention. That we have to, he has to put us in a position where we know it's absolutely God. And then we have to realize there's no way out but who? But God. And God's going to throw down his rod. And you're not going to be able to match it. God's going to throw down a senior year in college to show you this isn't what life's about. God's going to throw down viewing your mother in your casket like Terry did. And you can't throw down that rod. God's going to throw down a rod with your addictions and you're going to realize I can't overcome them. God's going to throw down the sinfulness of your life when you are seven, like Carl Hauser talked about last week. God is going to throw down a rod until you realize you can't match it and you can't get out of it. Why do some events happen? And this is an explanation for everything. To get people's attention to realize they need somebody. They need the Lord. They need Jesus Christ. They need that forgiveness. And we sit up there in our stubbornness and we throw down rods. Certainly, I got it in here somewhere. I can get out of this. I can do this. And God's just sitting there waiting until you're done until the magicians come to Pharaoh and say, guess what, boss? We can't match this. We have nothing. Today, world has become much more arrogant. 
Today, the world throws down rods and dares God to match it. Every time we as a society legalize sin, in essence, we are throwing a rod down in front of God and mocking him. And what the world doesn't realize is this, God will not be mocked. When it is clear that God is, when it is clear God is doing something in your life, you cannot stop. That you cannot fix. That's the time to open your heart up to God. But guess what? What did Pharaoh do? He hardened it again. Until it cost him his what? Look over at Exodus 13, 15. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew his firstborn in the land of Egypt. My friend, that is stubborn. When I'm in the wrong and I stay in the wrong until it costs somebody dear to me their life. Then Pharaoh woke up temporarily. Then he still what? He still chased them until ultimately he what? They all. Can a heart really be that hard? Answer is what? Better believe it can be. What's our heart? It's our emotions. It's our will. It's our personality. It's all those things that we listed at the beginning of the message. And what will happen if you harden just one part of it? A hard heart forbids God from speaking to that same heart for your good. Though we certainly have not hardened our hearts like Pharaoh did, we have received Jesus Christ and his deliverance. There are periods of time when we are no better than Pharaoh. So what happened? God for God. I can get the same outcome doing it my way. I'll throw down my rod. I can match God's claims and his results. Doing it my way. I will harden my heart. Match God's claim and actually make things worse for myself and those around me. but then realize I can't get out of it. Then I will temporarily turn to God. And I'm sure right now it's going through our heads. We know people like that. Hard times, hard times, realize I can't get out. Temporary repentance, pseudo repentance. I don't know what actually to call it. And then as soon as God lets them out, what? Gone. Gone until what? Next time. But in the meantime, here's the sad part. They have the potential to go and destroy other people, including themselves. Cannot match God. Pride kicks in. And I refuse to humble myself under God's hand. And I will be stubborn to the point that you could actually destroy someone dear to me, destroy that life, and I still won't budge. 
right? I'll throw down my rod and ask, dare God to match it. These are all ways we harden our hearts, right? And again, it, for Christianity, for anyone here in this room, it's not a blanket. It's usually one area God just gets. God just speaks to you. And you just harden your heart against that area. And I'm telling you, it's detrimental. And young people don't do it. How in the world on the campus I graduated from college from, just down the road from where I stayed in the same dorm, a kid shoots his mom and dad. How does that happen? How do we get there? My niece and nephew on that same campus. My niece fortunately comes home. My nephew locked up in his room. How do we get there? This stuff's real. My sister's home crying her eyes out, not knowing about her son. How do we get there? Here's a way. That boy said, this is the result I want. I'm throwing down my rod. Right? This is how I want out. Young people, this stuff is real. Aren't you sick and tired of watching your peers destroy themselves? That, isn't that getting it to you? Haven't we had enough? No. We're going to throw more rods down right in God's face and dare him. Don't harden your heart. If today you would hear his voice, harden not your what? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't wait until your house is destroyed. Don't wait until your loved ones are destroyed. Don't wait until your goals and dreams are destroyed. And then finally, you'll be destroyed. Don't harden your heart. Let's stand.